Amen. So you're wondering right away uh, this evening, we're studying Joshua chapter 19. That hasn't changed. Why in the world did we just read Genesis chapter 30? And the reason for it is because we're still going to study Joshua chapter 19, but I didn't have the heart inside me to make Brother Ryan read Joshua chapter 19 um, again and again and again, because we're going to be there for the next three weeks or so. And plus, uh, I want it to be as edifying as possible. We're continuing to just study through the tribes of Israel in uh, Joshua, the chapters um, in Joshua that kind of lay out the inheritance of Israel. Turn to Joshua chapter 19, if you would. We're going to start in verse number 10. And uh, if you're wondering, if you ever wondered about that story in Genesis 30, where Jacob um, put the poplars and the rods and all that stuff, you ever wondered? Well, let me just explain that from a from a livestock, uh, from a cattleman's perspective, real quick before we get started with the sermon. Basically, what he was doing was all the speckled and the certain type of of sheep. Um, were to be his. So what he did was when those type of sheep or what they call the strong ones um, at the end of the chapter came to drink, he put something in the water that, want, that made them want to breed, basically. So he's sitting there, he's controlling their breeding cycles. So as soon as the ones that he knew would be his um, would go to the water, he would put something in there that would make them um, breed. And then thus, after um, uh, you know, time, all you would ha have all spotted and speckled cattle. You know, if you have um, you know, genetics are a funny thing, but basically you have better odds of getting a speckled lamb if you have a speckled mom and a speckled dad. You can still get a white lamb or a, or a brown or a solid colored lamb, but it's more likely than not. Um, so that's what he was doing there. He was just, he was uh, selective. He was selective breeding is what he was doing. So selective breeding in the Bible. All right. Um, cattle ranchers and, and uh, registered um, people raising res registered cattle. And, and Brother uh, Trevor knows what I'm talking about. Registered cattle, registered livestock. They do this all the time. Um, they measure traits of animals. And they, they breed certain animals with certain animals to get certain traits. And they measure those traits. And they make sure that they, they breed um, with the right animals. And then they end up with a very strong um, crop or a, a very strong herd or flock or whatever. My wife's dad um, was one of the um, a very well-known Ang black Angus cattle rancher in western North Dakota and he was just known to have um, some of the best cattle in the state. And the reason he did that, it wasn't an accident. It's not like, oh, you know, I just have nice looking cattle. It's because he was very good at this. And he was very good at what Jacob was doing here. He was very good at seeing um, traits of animals and judging animals and making sure certain animals breed with, uh, with higher quality animals as well. That's exactly what Jacob was doing here. Okay, Joshua chapter 19. Let's look at verse number 10 and get into the sermon. We're going to be talking about the tribe of Zebulun this evening. Now these tribes that we're going to be talking about in the next couple of weeks, they're kind of like what I call just the obscure um, or, you know, you just don't, you haven't really heard much about them. But we can still learn things about these tribes in the Bible. So let's go ahead and look at it this evening. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, And the third lot came up for the children of Zebulun, according to their families, and the border of their inheritance was unto Sarad. And their border went up to the sea, to Mariah, and reached to Dabasheth, and reached unto the river that is before Jochneum. So basically Zebulun, if you look at where Judah is in the southern kingdom, so we, you know, when we break up the kingdoms, we have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom later on. And then, of course, the ten tribes are um, what is made up of the northern kingdom. And Zebulun is one of these ten tribes. And Zebulun kind of just gets folded into the ten tribes. But if you look at a map, of the 12 tribes of Israel. Zebulon is to the northwest of Judah, and it's a small, kind of obscure um, little tribe that is next to, is very close to the coast. And you'll see that when we read um, some of these things from the Bible. Go to Genesis chapter 49, and let's look at Jacob's um, prophecy or Jacob's blessing towards his son Zebulun. We saw Simeon last week. It was quite an interesting story. and We went through that. Let's look at um, Zebulun starting in the same place in Genesis chapter 49. Jacob's prophecy or Jacob's uh, blessing towards Zebulun is in verse number 13 where the Bible says this. It says, Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea. Just making reference to the location that Zebulun is. It's next to the sea, to the northwest of Judah. And he shall be for an haven of ships, and his border shall be unto Zidon. So that doesn't tell us a lot there. There's not a lot that Jacob is really saying about Zebulun other than the fact that he's going to be by the sea. But here's something that we do know. Turn to Judges 
chapter 1. Turn to Judges chapter 1. And Judges chapter 1 and verse number 30 that we're going to read here will kind of tell us why Zebulun is kind of just going to, you know, we haven't heard much about it. It's kind of obscure. Um, it kind of just um, went to the wayside as far as the history books are concerned, or as far as the Bible history is concerned. Look at Judges chapter 1 and verse number 30. Zebulun was one of the tribes that made this dire mistake. Look at verse number 30. It says, Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, nor the inhabitants of Nahalo, but the Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributary. So these, this is one of the tribes, this is one of the northern uh, most tribes that just, they didn't, and especially towards the coast, the Canaanites, this is where the Philistines were, um, they never really totally conquered the land. They kind of got to the end of the battling in, in the book of Joshua, and they're just kind of, they started setting people into tributaries. And I can about imagine somebody thought it was a pretty good deal. Somebody thought this was a pretty good idea. Hey, why destroy all these people? We can just have them work for us. We can have them pay taxes, and we can take th that from them. So Zebulun is one of, the, one of the tribes that made that mistake. They did not utterly destroy the people. And this is why, by the way, because there were so many tribes in the northern kingdom, this is one of the reasons that the northern kingdom was destroyed, you know, some 160 years before the southern kingdom of Judah. So right away we see that they started off on the wrong foot. Zebulun did. And they ended up folded, of course, into the northern kingdom. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 33. Here's some interesting, we'll just look at some interesting, maybe this will come up in a Bible trivia uh, game the kids are playing or something. I actually think I heard the Bible trivia game going on last week, and I think one of the questions, if I heard right, was, this guy died on the cross. Was that really a question in the Bible trivia game? I mean, because I think that Bible trivia is, is pretty dumbed down, if that's the case, right? This guy died on the cross. That's pretty bad when that's, that's considered a trivia question that most people wouldn't know. But I suppose most people don't know that anymore. But anyway, Deuteronomy chapter 33, look at verse 18. And of Zebulun he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. Issachar is a neighboring uh, tribe. They shall call the people unto the mountain. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall suck of the abundance of the seas. That's interesting. And of the treasures hid in the sands. So that's an interesting point right there, that Zebulon, because it's close to the sea, they're being blessed, like probably economically here, from the seas. There's easy commerce close to the coast, and they're talking about, you know, the, the coast itself being um, an economic, you know, uh, blessing, so to speak, to Zebulon because of their location. Now turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Turn to Isaiah chapter 9. So here we see that, you know, we know the location of Zebulun. We know that they didn't overcome and de totally destroy, utterly destroy the people um, that, they, um, that they took over the land from. And we see that they're, they're blessed, at least um, right away in Deuteronomy chapter 33. They're blessed because of the abundance of the seas. Maybe there's, there's fish and commerce and, and ships from other places that come in um, from the sea. Turn to Isaiah chapter 9. So here in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1, um, the first few verses of Isaiah chapter 9 is talking about the Messiah. It's a messianic prophecy in Isaiah. Look at verse number 1. Look what the Bible says. Nevertheless, the dimness sh not shall, shall not be as was in her vexation when at the first lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Nathali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nation. So here we see that Zebulon and these places next to the sea, now this blessing has suddenly not, it's not a blessing anymore. It says that they are grievously afflicted, how? By the way of the sea. So here we see the same way that was a blessing in the past is now a curse to them. So it's interesting to note here, just a kind of a lesson, is that you know blessings can easily become curses in your life. I mean, these people were blessed from a certain place, and you know, once they turned from the Lord, once all these things, you know, they let go of God and they let go, they forgot the Lord, you know, that became a curse to them. And that's exactly um, what will happen to us. That's exactly what will happen to our nation. That's exactly what happened to the nation of Israel again and again and again in the Bible. Well, now look at verse, uh, look at the end of verse number one. And it says, Beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. Look at verse number two. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Now we're talking about the prophecy of Jesus Christ. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. So look at the, 
the first, um, the last four words of this first verse, it says Galilee. And that's interesting because Zebulun, Galilee is inside of Zebulun. So what came out of Galilee? Turn to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. So verse number 2 is saying that these people that walked in, in darkness, they're now cursed. They're, they're now cursed from the same sea that blessed them. And they're in darkness now, it's, but they're going to see a great light. And of course, we see the messianic prophecy of Jesus Christ in the coming verses in Isaiah chapter 9. But look what happened in Galilee. Turn to John chapter 2. Here's your Bible trivia for you right here. Where did Jesus begin his ministry? John chapter 2 and verse number 1. In the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. The first miracle that Jesus ever did, the water into wine happened in Galilee. That's where Jesus began his ministry, in the land of Zebulun. So, for the most part, Zebulun is kind of this tribe that just kind of faded into obscurity. They kind of got folded. They kind of went. They didn't do things right from the beginning. They kind of got folded into the, the northern kingdom. And we know that, that the northern ten tribes, they were just wiped off the face of the earth. The Assyrians t took them and just mixed with them. And, you know, you can't find the ten tribes of, you know, of Israel anymore. But let's look a little bit deeper. Who was Zebulun? And that brings us back to Genesis chapter 30. I want to look at, really what I want to look at, that was all just for introduction. I want to look at who the man Zebulun was. What is the story of Zebulun? That brings us back to Genesis chapter 30. So turn there, if you would, and look at Genesis chapter 30 and verse number 19. Now, first of all, before we get into Genesis chapter 30 and verse number 19 and 20, talking about Zebulun, Genesis chapter 30 is a very sad chapter in the Bible. If you read Genesis chapter 30, especially the first part of the chapter, and you just read, you know, there's a reason that Jacob got to the end of his life and he said, you know what, um, you know, my days have been short and they've been evil. You know, it's just they haven't, he hasn't had a good life. You know, Genesis chapter 30 is giving us, you know, kind of a, a, a frame of Jacob's family life. And what a mess. What a mess it is. Look at Genesis chapter 30 and verse number 19. Let's look at the story of Zebulun and see what the Bible says here. And Leah conceived again and bare Jacob the sixth son. And Leah said, so this is the sixth son that she has given Jacob. And Leah said, God hath endued me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. And she called his name Zebulun. So Zebulun was Leah's six sons. Jacob, of course, had four wives that produced the 12 um, tribes of Israel, the 12 sons. And Leah was one of those wives, and she was the wife who was always, you know, kind of competing with Rachel to have the affection of her husband. And you see that here. Rachel was the one who was barren at the beginning of the chapter, and she couldn't give, you know, her husband a child and she was very sad, but she was the favorite of Jacob. And Leah was always just, you know, she was yearning for the affection of her husband. So here we see multiple wives competing for the favoritism of their husband. It's really kind of a sad situation in Genesis chapter 30. But, you know, we've talked about favoritism in the Bible as far as children goes. Uh, you know, many times in this church I've preached sermons on that. I've talked about how we are not to do that. But, you know, what about this situation? What about favoritism with wives? You know, I mean, we all don't have that problem here because if you're married, you have one wife. But that's really what I want to address this evening. I want to address this idea of multiple wives in the Old Testament. Because many people are frankly very confused about this. Many people read the Old Testament and they're very confused about this idea of men having multiple wives in the Old Testament. So let's talk about polygamy in light of the Bible, in light of the Bible this evening. You know, first of all, it appears, it appears at first reading, and this is why people will ask so many questions to their pastor. I've had people ask me several questions about this. It appears, and it's not altogether untrue, that God allowed this. That God allowed men to have uh, multiple wives in the Bible. I mean, look, he certainly didn't kill people for it. It's not like you married your second wife and God just killed you. That's not what happened in the Old Testament. But I want to explain to you this evening that God, might, while he might not have just struck someone dead at that moment for having multiple wives, 
I want to show you this evening that God did warn about it. God did warn about it, and not only did He warn about not doing it, but He warned that a specific judgment would come from it, from having multiple wives. So, albeit it's an it's a indirect judgment, but still, it's judgment all the same. And we'll look at that this evening. So first, before we get into this study this evening, let me just say that, that, that you have to understand, here's a Bible reading tip for you. You have to understand, in the Bible, when you're reading the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, where there's a lot of historical events and things that are, um, things that are listed, I mean, just history, that actually, here's what happened to the nation of Israel. Here's what happened with these tribes. They're historical books of the Bible. Stories in the Bible are not doctrine. You have to remember that. We studied through um, Judges. There's a lot of absolutely terrible things that happen in the book of Judges. And people are like, how could this be in the Bible? How could this be in the Bible, these terrible things that are happening, these people doing these terrible things? But first of all, you have to understand that stories, that historical books of the Bible, they're not doctrine. Turn to Judges chapter 21. Judges chapter 21. Judges chapter 21, and look at verse 25. Judges chapter 21 and verse 25. After all these horrible stories that we read about in Judges, here's what the Bible says in Judges chapter 21. And I'm glad that this verse is here, because although we know if you're a, a mature Bible um, you know, person, you know what I'm telling you is true. This is kind of a comfort right here. In Judges chapter 21, verse 25, because look, there's many cases in the book of Judges, where every single person on every side of the story was doing the wrong thing. Yes, there was tons of wicked people and, and sodomites and all these things in the stories in Judges 19, but there's also these guys that are like, hey, take my daughter, trying to save themselves, save their friends. Just look, everybody was wrong. There's many people that were doing wrong things. And in Judges chapter 21, 25, we kind of get this sigh of relief where it says, In those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did that was right in his own eyes. It's kind of prepping us for the first king and prepping us for this nation that comes out and says, Hey, you know, this is out of control. We need a leader. We need a king here. You know, they, were, they just weren't listening to God who was in charge, and they should have kept in charge. But everybody just doing what they thought was right. I mean, sound familiar? But the point I'm trying to make is this, before we get into this study, just because we have a story in the Bible does not mean that that's the way we are to do things. Okay, be careful with this. Stories must be coupled with doctrine. You see a lot of young preachers making this mistake. They'll just want to preach something and they'll have an idea, and then they will go pick a story out of the Bible that backs up their idea, and it's like, no, you must have doctrine and story to prove what the Bible actually says. Because, I mean, quite frankly, I mean, most stories in the Old Testament were people doing the wrong thing. Let's get, I mean, let's be realistic about it. People weren't really doing the right thing. So people need to use Bible, you know, people can't just use Bible stories to justify doctrine. Okay, so that being said, what does the Bible say about having multiple wives? In Genesis chapter 30, we see this story. It's not a great story, but here's some Bible doctrine for you. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now again, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and the verses that I'm going to read for you, we're talking about the qualifications of a pastor. But many times I've told you this before, the qualifications of a pastor are all things that are also good for you. The only difference between the qualifications of a pastor between you and me is that if you do the things or you don't do the things that are the qualifications listed in 1 Timothy chapter 3, then you have to confess that to God and you have to work on that and you have to get that, that right and get that better. If I don't do these things, I'm not qualified to have this job, is what the Bible says. But let's look at it. The Bible says, 1 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse number 2. A bishop then must be blameless. Then it says, the husband of one wife. Then it goes into many other things, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, all good things. All good things that every Christian should be. And one of those things listed is the husband of one wife. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17 is giving commands to kings. It's talking about what a king should be like, what the leader of a nation should be like. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse number 15. 
Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse number 15. Again, this, sh this is God speaking. This is doctrine here. This is not a Bible story. This is a command. This is what the Bible says that is to happen. Period. Deuteronomy 17, 15. Thou shalt in any wise set him a king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt, shalt thou set a king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. He's saying, hey, when you're going to pick a leader of your nation, don't go find some heathen. Don't go find some heathen that doesn't even believe in the Lord to rule over you. That's a pretty simple one right there. It says, but he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses, for as much as the Lord hath said unto you, he shall henceforth, henceforth return no more that way. He's saying, hey, he's, he should keep you where you're supposed to be. Look at verse number 17. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. So the horses, he's saying, hey, don't have this guy that's just going and trying to get everybody means of transportation to get out of this land that you're supposed to be in. He says, neither, and then he goes into another reason, neither shall he multiply wives to himself. Why? Why shouldn't he multiply wives to himself? And the Bible tells us that his heart turned not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. So verse number 17 is talking about a command to a king to keep his heart right. You get that? It's all about verse number, verse number um, 16 is, is pragmatism. That you need to stay put. You need to stay where God has you. Stay where God wants you. Verse number 17 is about the king's heart going bad. And it's talking about two things could do that. Money can make your heart go bad and multiple wives. And you're like, what? Well, let's, uh, let's look. Let's we'll look at that this evening in the Bible. Look at Genesis chapter 2. Let's go back to the beginning of marriage. Let's go back to the beginning of marriage. You say, you know, I mean, who invented marriage? God invented marriage. God invented this thing. So, I mean, I think he gets to make the rules. That's why, you know, I don't care what they say about marrying a donkey or marrying a, a wall or whatever. It's not marriage. Right. Marriage is when a man marries a woman. That's marriage. Right. You know, I can stand up here and say that I'm an elephant with polka dots, but that doesn't make it true. Ma they, look, this is where Christians went wrong 20 years ago. Yep. Like the, the, the debate over homosexual marriage. Should it be legal? Should it be legal to, for homosexuals to get married? Well, what do you mean? It's not even real. I reject the question. I reject the question. I'm not taking the poll. Should have been the answer. All right? But see, it, it, the devil's tricky. Uh -huh. The devil's tricky. Go to Genesis chapter 2, look at verse 23. Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 23. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. One, and they shall be one flesh. Look, one flesh. Not four, not 700. You know, not this. Polygamy was never God's plan. It was never God's plan. Polygamy, multiple wives, this was man's plan. This is what man did. And we know, and I'll show you this evening, when we diverge from God's plan... When you diverge from any part of God's plan in your life, if you stand, I stand up here and I preach some sermon on X, Y, and Z, and you're like, you know what, man? It's like, I like what you preached the last five sermons, and I liked what the Bible said there, but that one I'm not doing. Go ahead and diverge. And, and I don't have to do anything about that, because look, when you diverge from God's plan, it's all going to go wrong for you. So one thing that you notice in the Bible is that men that have multiple wives, you find me one. Men that had multiple wives had nothing but conflict in their lives. It, look, it was never, it was never a romantic relationship. It was never a good relationship. I mean, look, look at Genesis 30. This is a terrible situation. I mean, you literally have this woman who is just, like, she is just torn down to pieces. She has literally given her husband six sons, and she's like, maybe he'll love me now. It's sad. I mean, look, but here it's basically these men, they were following the lusts of the flesh and they were sacrificing a loving relationship with a woman. That's what they were doing. Look, turn to um, so Song of Solomon chapter 1. 
In Solomon, in Solomon's life, we can see this directly. We can see both sides of this coin. You can see it in the Bible. It's documented in the Bible with David and Solomon. I'll show you both of those this evening. But Solomon's is the most in-your-face. Just, man, this is what he gave up right here. Sol Song of Solomon documents the relationship between Solomon and his first wife. And his first wife. And if you read, let's just read just a couple of verses. Look at Song of Solomon, chapter 1, and verse number 9. In Song of Solomon, it's basically this letter being written back and forth between these two, between the king and his wife. Look at verse number 9. I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses and Pharaoh's chariots. Pharaoh's daughter is who she was. Thy cheeks are comely with rows of jewels, thy neck and chains of gold. We will make thee borders of gold and studs of silver. While the king sitteth at his table, my spikenard sendeth forth the smell thereof. A bundle of myrrh is well beloved unto me. He shall lie at my night betwixt, be, uh, betwixt my breasts. This is her speaking to him. My beloved is under, unto me as a cluster of campfire in the vineyards of Egnedi. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Now he's talking to her. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes. Behold, thou art fair, my beloved. Yea, pleasant. Our, also our bed is green. The beams of our house are cedar and our rafters of fir. I mean, look, it's embarrassing to read this. You read this and you're just like, you feel like you're reading some intimate letter between some man that he's just, and, and his wife, and you're just like, man, I, I've opened up someone's diary and I shouldn't be reading this. But I mean, that's why God puts it in here. The book continues in following chapters and it's just ridiculously over the top between these two. I mean, it's very loving, very intimate, almost embarrassing to read out loud. Now turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Let's look at the end of Solomon's life. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. So I mean, basically Solomon, when he married this woman, he married Pharaoh's daughter. It was just this huge romantic relationship. They were totally in love with each other. The story of the, the book of Song, Song of Solomon is like, no, I love you. It's like, no, I love you more. And I love you. I love you. And you're like, bah. You're like, stop it. You're just like, I shouldn't even be reading this. But look, it's just this huge love story between these two. But then look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, also written by Solomon, but at the end of his life. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, look at verse 28. Look what the Bible says. It says, which yet my soul seeketh. Solomon is saying, I'm still looking for this, but I find not. He's like, I'm still looking for this, but I can't find it. It says, one, one man among a thousand have I found. He's like, one good friend, one good man among a thousand good men. He's like, I've found that needle in the haystack. Look what he says. But a woman among all those have I not found. You're like, what? You're like, what in the world? What happened? What happened? Turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. I'll show you what happened. You're like, you're like he had it. You're like, he had it. We just read it. What is he talking about, one, one woman I can't find? He's like, I can find a good man. If I go through a thousand men, I'll find a good one. But he's like, I can't find a good woman. I can't find a good woman. Look at 1 Kings chapter 11. Look at verse number 1. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse number 1. And here's where it all went bad that caused him to write Ecclesiastes chapter 7 at the end of his life. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh. Women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Of the nations, by the way, of nations you weren't even supposed to marry women from these heathen nations. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go in unto them, neither they shall come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your what? Your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives princesses and 300 concubines which is all you know it's like a wife who's a who's a handmaid or a servant and his wives what what do they do what did his wives do they turned away his heart i mean that's what the bible told us that was going to happen and that's exactly what happened to solomon i mean it sounds familiar they tar turned his heart away from what i mean mainly they turned his heart away from the lord is especially these heathen women, but also clearly, if you read Ecclesiastes chapter 7, they clearly turned his heart away from his wife. And guess what? I can guarantee you that it turned his wife's heart away from him as well. I mean, just think, just think of this pragmatically. Think of this pragmatically. Could you really have a close relation? All you married guys, 
Could you really have a close relationship with your wife if there was multiple other women involved? No. Of course, of course you couldn't. I mean, 700, 300 more? I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. Look at David and Michael. David and Michael. David, in 1 Samuel chapter 18, we won't turn there, I'll just tell you the story. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, the Bible says that Michael loved David. It says Michael loved David. It was Saul's daughter. And how do we know David loved her? Because Saul thought he was going to kill David. by He's like, oh, my daughter loves him. And obviously David loved her because he went out and Saul's like, I'm going to have him go out and say he has to go get me a, a hundred foreskins from the Philistines. I'm going to kill David. Saul hated David. He was jealous of David. He, was, he wanted David dead. So he tells, you want to marry my daughter? Go, go kill a hundred Philistines. David's like, okay, he kills 200. And he brings, you know, the trophies back and he marries his daughter. But then in 2 Samuel chapter 6, David has married so many other women and he has just, you know, he has gotten it, his marriage to the point where it says Michael literally despised him. It says she literally despised him. So you say, you know, you say, okay, I see, I see what you're getting at, um, you know, but why, why preach this? You know, why preach this? It's not like, you know, we're struggling um, with this today. I mean, even in America, with all of our problems, you know, you don't see polygamy everywhere. So what's the point? You know, we don't seem, with all of our issues that we have and all of our perversions that we have, we don't seem to have this problem. But yes, we do. And you're like, what? Look, here's what we know from the Bible. We know from the Bible when, when, it, when the right thing is not done that there are severe consequences in this case. That your heart is turned from the Lord. That your heart is turned from your wife. And hers, look, it's, it, hers is turned from you. I can't imagine something worse like on earth happening to me than my wife's heart being turned from me. I mean, what a severe thing that would be. Look, and, and look, you look at, um, you look at Genesis chapter 30, it, it causes the wife, the wife a lot of pain. You can just literally hear the pain in, I mean, think about that as a person when you're reading those verses and just imagine the emotional pain that this woman has. I just want my husband to want to be with me. And this woman thinks maybe if I just give him one more son, one more son. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a sad, terrible thing. I mean, look what she says. God hath endued me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. And she called his name Zebulun. So, there's real consequences here. And you say, you know, why did they do it and how does it apply to me? Well, here's why they did it. They did it to fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's why they did it. I hate to break it to you, but that's why they did it. You can't say they did it so, for more children. I mean, 700 children? You know, 700 times 4, 2,800 children? I mean, could you really say, you know, most people can't ha handle one or two? You're going to say Solomon's going to raise 2,800, you know, 5,000 children and be a great father to them? That's not why they did it. You can, clearly cannot be a, he didn't do it to be a parent to hundreds of children. But here's the thing, it does apply to us. You say how? You say how? Because men today seem to have a problem with fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Men today do the same thing. Married men today do the same thing. Married men, Christian men do the same thing. And they may not have physical relationships, but guess what? What you are looking at, the Bible says does, it, it's the same thing. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 28. It's almost like, it's almost like Jesus knew the future. You think? It's almost like Jesus knew what was going to happen. Matthew 5 Verse number 28. Matthew 5, verse 20, number 28. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Notice here. Notice here. It's, it's a heart issue again. We're talking about the same thing. We're talking about the same thing that Solomon did. Look, on both sides, with the husband and the wife. We saw that in the Bible. The heart issue will be the same as with Solomon, the same as with David. And you say, you know, well, well will God bless it? Here's the thing. Here's the thing, and I looked up, you know, I, I hate having to look up these statistics, but here's the thing. These statistics are changing. I've been doing this now for two years, a little over two years. These statistics are getting worse. 
They're getting worse. 66% of men today regularly look at pornography. 66%. And guess what? When you look at 18 to 24 year old men, it's 70, 71, 72%. It's going like this. Look, let me do the math for you on that. That means that if you have a young man between 18 and 24, and we're just randomly you know, going to grab one, you have, a, you have double the chances of grabbing one that regularly looks at pornography. And the scary thing is, is that when you look amongst, and I understand that Christian in these polls, what a Christian man is, is, not, is all messed up. I get that. But there's really no significant statistical difference. That's pitiful. Look, I, here's the thing. How is that different than having multiple women that you're in relationships with? I mean, I, bet, I wonder if the wives in the room tonight would think it's different. I wonder if the wives, I mean, how, I mean, how many wives in the room tonight wouldn't care if that's what their husband did on a regular basis? And even if they said, I, I wouldn't care, I, I wouldn't believe them. I bet most would view this exactly as Leah views her life. Think about that. Think about that, men. You're making your wife Leah. You're making your wife ask the questions, why am I not good enough? What is wrong with me? What is wrong with me that he needs to seek out? Why, what do I have to do to get my husband to love me? This is what you're turning your wife into. And guess what? Guess what? The consequences will be the same. Even if you think no one knows. The consequences will be the same. You could ruin the biggest blessing that God has provided for you on this earth. Folks, you better think about this when you're raising kids, too. How many, how many, I mean, I brought an example with me, and I can't remember what I did with it. Okay, here we go. I've never bring this up here, but how many devices do you have in your house that are connected to the internet? If you allow your children to ever be on a device that is connected to the internet, please listen to me carefully. If you allow your children to ever be on a device that is connected to the internet without proper supervision, you are brain dead. Brain dead. Mentally not there. Why not just shoot them up with heroin? You're like, I'm serious. Shoot them up with heroin. You need to have monitoring programs and then you need to be monitoring the monitoring programs. You can't just put a monitoring program on something and just forget about it. You know how smart kids are today? You gotta monitor the monitoring programs. Look, when I looked up the stats for this sermon, I gotta tell my wife, I gotta, I, I gotta be a look, look out. Look out, you're gonna be getting like a bunch of like, your phone's gonna light on fire here pretty quick. Because I mean, I just, you just type in certain things on anything in my house. My phone, anybody's phone, computers, whatever. Anything that could possibly connect to the internet, you type in the wrong things and things just explode. You will raise, I mean, look, you don't think it's a big deal. You'll raise a child that'll ruin some girl's life one day, is what you'll do. You'll raise a child that'll ruin a girl's life. You want your daughter, you want your daughter to be Aaliyah? You want your daughter, I mean, look, we're supposed to do things different. We're supposed to be smarter. We're supposed to have, what's this word? We're supposed to have wisdom. Amen. Same problems exist today, folks, just in different forms. We have to protect these kids from these things, and this takes effort. Here's another thing you can do. A lot of you are sitting here in the room tonight, and you're like, you know, my kids are young. I don't have to worry about this. My kids are one, two, three, four years old. They're not on the internet. Here's another thing you can do. You can teach them to, I don't know, not fulfill every lust of the flesh that comes in front of them. You can, like, here's something that, that some people in this church just, it, it seems impossible for them to do. You can say no to your kids. I want that. No. You know, how many, how many times should I say no to them? Several times a day. Because kids, in their natural state, are like, I want that. Give it to me. And it takes you stopping them. It takes you, I mean, that's what, what, parents, that's what they're for. You will raise and you think it's no big deal. You say it's no big deal, it's a cookie. It's no big deal, it's a toy. 
It's no big deal. Just, you know, I just want her to be happy. Here's the thing. It'll start out with a cookie and a toy, and this is how it ends right here. It ends up with them just whatever desire that they have, fulfilling it. And that will be a disaster. Man, you're going to have problems. Please listen. Or you are going to have problems. As your kids get older, these problems will get more and more serious. You say, man, this is pretty, this, this sermon took a turn for the, for the depressing. Every single time I have to preach on this, it's depressing. Because the numbers are getting worse and worse all the time. And I'm just like, how, how could that be? How, how could that be? Look, I, I, you go around, you go out, and you go to work, and you see people. I get it. I see how that is. It shouldn't be getting worse for us. Shouldn't be an issue for us. It's like, look, I'm a problem solver. There's, there's ways to solve this problem. There's things to put in place to solve this problem, to make sure it doesn't become a problem for your families. And you can't homeschool your kids and, and protect them from the public school and do all these things and bring them to church and then just allow the gates of literal hell into your house through your computer and set your kid in front of it, or set yourself in front of it, because guess what? Guess what? you got a problem? You better get rid of it, because your problem is going to be multiplied in your kids. David had eight wives. David had eight wives. Solomon had a thousand. Think about that. Think about that when you got problems, men. Ladies, think about that when you got problems. You got sin in your life, and you're like, oh, you know what? It's just me. My kids are going to be better. No, good chance they're going to be worse than you. <laughs> Polygamy in the Bible, we see that it just it ruins relationships. It ruins relationships. The same thing can happen to us today through this stuff. I'm going to scare the literal hell out of you on Sunday morning with the sermon on Sunday morning. I'm going to, I'm going to, I mean, you'll probably just take everything that's connected to anything, you'll probably just throw it in the garbage if I do a good job. I had to stop writing the sermon twice. I'm going to scare the little hell out of you, and that's, that's, the, that's the, my goal on Sunday morning. It's, you think, man, this sounds bad. It's way worse than you think. It's way worse than you think. It's like, I mean, I'm talking demons. I'm talking, I'm talking Satan himself is running this show. And I'll prove it to you. And I'll prove it to you. It's been going on for 30, 40 years. And it's, man, the game's almost complete the way I see it. I'm just like, how could it possibly get worse than this? Think about this stuff. Every single thing that you see in the Bible applies to you. There's a reason Jesus said that just looking and lusting is the same as adultery. Because you can do the exact same thing that Solomon did and David did to your marriage today, to your kids today. Save somebody's daughter and raise your kids right. Save your son's marriage and say no to your kids. And you know what? Put some protections in place. You're going to go through all this effort to homeschool your kids and put these curriculums together. It, 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 it's so dangerous. It's so dangerous. Just, just let them play with a loaded gun. Amen. This is what we're talking about here. This is how serious it is. Lessons from Zebulun and not how not to have a Genesis 30 family. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.